Okay, thank you. Um, thank you to Strelka Institute for organizing this event uh, and for the invitation. Uh, as someone who's been following, following the organization with uh, enthusiasm for quite a while, it's really an honor uh, and a thrill to be, uh, to be able to be here today. And, and I really can't thank the organizers enough for uh, really a kind of unbelievable level of organization and hospitality. Uh, and, and thank you all to you for coming out on a Sunday afternoon. I'm sorry that I don't uh, speak Russian, but I hope that you can bear with me. Uh, and um, I think the translators are, are quite uh, amazing. So, so I'm sure I sound better through them than uh, if you were listening to me in English. Uh, it's been a really uh, stimulating weekend so far, and I hope that I can uh, contribute uh, somehow, I, I thought I would try to do so by, by exploring some of these ideas related to infrastructure as they might pertain to these questions of the smart city, uh, such as we have been <coughs> looking at them. Um, my suggestion is that whatever we call the future of urbanism, that infrastructure will be a fundamental feature of it, uh, more, th more than it ever has been in the past, perhaps. But but infrastructure remains a difficult thing to think about designing differently. And this is part of its power, but also part of its challenge. That's because I think the urban condition is something that's becoming more and more automated. It's becoming logistical. And that's, uh, that's what I want to talk about this afternoon. So in a way, what I want to, to share with you today is, is some, some observations, some thoughts about how logistics connects to everyday life. These are examples from a uh, United States context, but I hope that they, they will resonate somehow with, with uh, your own experiences and contexts. And in a certain way, these are looking at the physical manifestations of all of this discussion about data and Internet of Things um, as they might pertain to, to the city. So um, just a little bit more quickly about, about who I am. Uh, I'm an architectural designer, I'm also a researcher and educator, and I'm trying to develop a practice that combines research and design, which for me work in a mutually informative way. And, and my work looks at the relationship between logistics and infrastructure to the built environment. Through this work, I'm interested in the sources of architectural form and of urban form and the ways that representational approaches might be developed to deepen an understanding of both their history and their potential. To develop my work, I've been expanding its scope in order to articulate and theorize logistics uh, more precisely, I hope, but also to establish a more general analytical interpretation of its implications and opportunities for the built environment. So my work uh, provides a venue to explore speculative uh, work and material work that uh, my more sort of academic work uh, illuminates. So. In general, I hope that uh, looking, looking for a deeper understanding of things gives us a way to both uh, understand, the, take care of the world better, but also to, to imagine it differently. Um, I'm also um, teaching urban design, where we look at the city, as has been mentioned before, as a kind of living thing, as a dynamic and unpredictable entity that requires nimble frameworks to address it. I also look at questions of infrastructure, in the city, so through questions of, for example, speculations about nature and production, or in this case, um, uh, looking at the future of food. This was a study of, of a future uh, protein source, and the students developed a combination of a cricket, cricket farm and restaurant media complex. And we started by looking at how systems work and then try to engage those things holistically. So however, today I'm going to focus not really on design work, but more on my own research into Infrastructure, which is something I understand as a, as a complex mixture of ambient, technological, symbolic, and aesthetic conditions that remains, I think, in, in, uh, it's capable of being theorized and historicized and speculated about still. There's, there's lots of work, I think, to be done. Uh, present company may be excluded today. We've been, we've been hearing lots of great examples of people working in this uh, context. So. So in this, in this context, the conference about life in the city, I come at it from the position of architecture and urban design. And that brings with it a belief that life in the city 
is conditioned by the built environments. But one might ask, what conditions the built environment? And so with my, um, some of my work, and including the, my book, The Rule of Logistics, uh, I've been trying to answer that question a little bit by looking at technology and how technology shapes the built environment. And so to, to start, maybe one question is how, how we've looked at infrastructure in the past. There's a number of different approaches. These are some examples of, of really fantastic empirical work that looks at logistics, at, I mean, sorry, at, at infrastructure. Um, there's, a, there's an amazing body of work from science and technology uh, and society studies that understands infrastructure as a large technical system. Uh, and recently, there's been a surge in anthropological attention to infrastructure, especially focusing on some of the political dimensions uh, of it. So uh, one, one uh, fantastic author, Brian Larkin, has l been interested in not just infrastructure as a th physical thing, but also as a conceptual thing and as an aesthetic thing. And he has a number of, of phrases that I find helpful about the infrastructural form. So one is that form is a matter of ordering, that uh, form forms things, or that form induces cognitive and affective dispositions. And again, as designers, we might ask, what forms form? So there's no single answer, but today I'd like to try to tell three stories about uh, three artifacts or moments that look at how technology, organization, and imagination all contribute to shaping the form of the built environment. Um, I can briefly put this in a sort of larger context. We heard yesterday from Francesca Bria's brilliant lecture, a similar kind of um, history of industrialization. I, I would take it a little differently um, to focus on how we've seen different phases of this. So from industrialization and the transformation of resources into to power, from then to mechanization uh, in which those processes uh, that would supplement human labor became more and more um, uh, part of a machine system and, and estranged uh, people from the products of their work. And increasingly, these, um, these processes are becoming automated, as we've been hearing about today. So, so as information becomes more and more central to our contemporary city, we see another layer being added on to the technical transformations. And that's what I've been calling the logistical the, the management of things in time and space. And again, we've been hearing a lot about that uh, over, the, over the weekend, uh, which makes sense given the theme of the conference. Um, so I think this is leading to a number of the features that we start to recognize in the discourse around uh, the smart city related to management and sensing and optimization. So just to give you maybe a more concrete example of how this would work, or uh, you know, examples of how this has affected the city, I use an example of where uh, my home in, in New York City you can, you can imagine the industrial version of the city in which goods came on a boat and they were manually unloaded into the middle of the city using all of these piers that were right next to the center of Manhattan. In the middle uh, image, the mechanized version of that, which is the, the, the mechanized container port on the edge of the city, actually in New Jersey. And then I think now we're starting to see this becoming increasingly automated. And you can see that with the, this image of, of Amazon Robotics, which I'll talk about. Uh, in a little in a little bit, but so what is logistics anyway? Um, according to a recent advertisement from UPS, the uh, global package delivery service, logistics makes the world work better. And uh, with the slogan, the company suggests that the services provide that it provides make it easier for people to improve their own businesses by enabling the exchange of goods in a timely, reliable, and transparent manner. UPS uh, claims that logistics is a continuous link that's always in sync and that with logistics, technology knows right where everything goes. And so I'd like to play this, um, this commercial for you just so you get a sense of the way that these corporations talk about logistics. Oh, but we lost the sound. There you go.
Um, so I, I love this commercial because it forms a kind of overture of, of the effects of logistics on the city. And you can see through these images how logistics is superimposed over the city, but still governed by its morphology. The, the chirping, the cheerful chirp of the barcode uh, is this kind of um, signal of the decrypting technologies that are necessary to produce and cope with this data-rich environment, and of course implying all of the giant communication infrastructures that that uh, implies. It, the, the frictionless floor over which augmented strength and speed and mobility uh, take place, the way that technology allows access to city that re cities that resist it, uh, whether morphologically or legally, or both in the case of Venice, where here uh, you're actually not allowed to drive, but somehow UPS is finding a way to get around that. Um, the reflection of the city through logistics, the fragmentation of the city through logistics, the role of cities as a manifestation of global capital, uh, the, the imagery of resource flows throughout the city, the deep reach of logistics into the depths of the historic city, and then of course the emotional dimension of receiving your package against all odds, all of that enabled by the barcode. And this image, this commercial suggests a version of the urban that's, that's helpless against the relentless drive of the logistical impulse and fueled by infrastructural development. And, and while infrastructure is fundamental to the urban, with the automatic city or, or with the logistical city, these new infrastructures emerge, but I think we're at a moment where they're not fully formed and they offer opportunities to think about where they ought to go, how they ought to develop, and by what means we might engage them. These infrastructures are also laced with tensions and frictions and ambiguities, and I would say that we need a similarly supple set of techniques for engaging them, some approaches that recognize these behaviors and are comfortable in their ambiguities. Um, so in other words, rather than trying to find a single uh, solution, we look for multi-directional, multi multimodal ways to engage these things. And, and we might search for these strategies that deal with both the object and the medium of infrastructure. And so, what do I mean by that? The, um, the typeface I've been using, this is, the pre this is um, Bell Gothic, which was developed for, for AT&T and Bell Labs. And uh, this is a precursor to this font, which is a very strange looking character. Uh, this is Bell Centennial, developed in 1975 by a type designer, Matthew Carter. So what, why does it look like this? Why is, what's going on with these strange divots? Bell Centennial was designed by, for AT&T to deal with a printing problem, a very specific material challenge. The, the Bell Gothic that they had developed was before they needed to print phone books at such a volume, and the small serifs on the actual letter form, on the actual, the actual lead font would get worn down by the frequency of printing, and then the, the small names on the phone book would become illegible. So they commissioned Carter to design a better version of that. And what he figured out, <coughs> knowing the, where this thing was going, he developed these, these little divots, which are ink traps. So when the, the inked letter form strikes the absorptive newsprint, the ink would bleed into the corners and would complete the form of the M. So, so the ideal M on the left is sort of prepared. It's kind of, um, it has this anticipation of what will happen once it's instantiated in its milieu. It's prepared to transform once it contacts its medium. So if you consider this maybe as a kind of symbol or as maybe a metaphor or metonym for, for the infrastructural objects in their situation, I think it might be a way to think about what this thing called an infrastructural imagination might be, something that fuels both the object poised to activate, but also the medium ready to receive it. And so if we are in an era of the logistical city, and if the logistical city is fundamentally infrastructural, maybe let's think about some of the ways that this logistical technology is shaping the built environment. And so I have a few stories about this. One starts with this pack of chewing gum. This, um, perhaps you know Juicy Fruit, a wonderful American product. This was the, um, this was the first ever barcoded product. So on June 26th, in a very small town uh, called Troy, Ohio, in, in, in uh, the Midwest, uh, June 26th, this is official barcode day. There's a holiday. Uh, this is the birthday. On 1974, this is when a cashier at the local, the local supermarket sold the world's first barcoded product, this 10-pack of juicy fruit chewing gum. And within two years, just two years, over 75% of items in a typical supermarket would bear this mark, this barcode. So uh, 30 years later, the town celebrated the event's 30th anniversary at the original site 
of the transaction by eating barcode decorated cake in the presence of the original cashier. That's a little hard to read, I see, sorry about that. Um, and uh, the, the, this 10 pack is usually on display in our National Historical Museum, but they, they brought it out of storage for this event. Um, so enabled by the increased speed and affordability of computing, the barcode transformed how objects were imagined because it not only encoded them with information, it also allowed them to be treated like information. So imagine what's happening here in a way. We've, we're celebrating the birthday, the, the moment when we've introduced this machine language. We basically are celebrating the surrender in a way to uh, this machine world. And I think the barcode is a kind of infrastructural element that does what I'm describing. Uh, it's a sticky kind of loose form. It's easy to become ubiquitous and by doing so, it changes our reality a little bit. They're, they're machine readable symbols that translate a string of numbers legible to humans, in this case a product code, uh, into a string of bits legible, I'm sorry, a string of numbers legible to humans, in this case a product code, into a string of bits legible to computers. It's one of the first symbols designed for computers to be read by computers. So not only did this help manage and record inventory, they also helped to store, uh, help, help different stores and retailers to better understand what people were buying. This was in a way, um, this echoes with what we've just been hearing about. This is a sort of early version of, of data aggregation in order to fuel uh, predictions. So simply by retrieving desired items and handing them to a cashier to be scanned, shoppers became the store stockists and market analysts. Consumer behavior is, of course, very fickle, uh, and the barcode helps to manage the risk associated with unpredictable customer desire. Which brings me to uh, Walmart, which is something I've been looking at for a little while. Um, it's one of the largest logistical players uh, globally, and it's become a sort of fruitful uh, area of study. The, um, yesterday we heard about the largest companies in terms of market capitalization. Uh, if we look at, at the largest companies in terms of revenue, we see that Walmart is still a uh, number, the largest one with 500, um, just over $500 billion of revenue last year. Um, a, a, not a distant second is um, China's state grid, followed by Sinopec and then um, the China National Petroleum Corporation and Royal Dutch Shell. So we're still in a kind of um, uh, petroleum uh, world here, except for Walmart, this strange corporation that is a retailer. If we were to look at it in terms of GDP, according to, to the UN version, Walmart would be somewhere between Sweden uh, and Poland. But what I find so fascinating from an architectural point of view is that Walmart is dependent on buildings. The way that it's so successful is that it, it builds a building every few days and uh, allows it to reach its, its market base, its customers. So how many buildings are that? This is in the, in the US, if you put them all together, um, you would have uh, which is based this much, which is basically the size of Manhattan. Um, so imagine that it takes about nine hours to walk from tip to tip of Manhattan, and then imagine doing that, uh, that same walk for nine hours through a Walmart to give you a sense of just the kind of scale of their operation. This is just the, the interiors. Uh, they also are, um, are data ravenous. They are, um, they are both hungry for data, and they are also giant producers of data. One study from Harvard Business Review suggests that Walmart uh, is responsible for almost 2.5% of the world's data. So just consider that for a moment. Um, and what for? Again, this is all to anticipate customer desire. So, so one example here, um, when Walmart, who works with their private weather, uh, weather corporation, when they get uh, warnings about a hurricane, they know that people in that affected area will will try to buy more Pop-Tarts, which is this kind of funny uh, toaster pastry. And so a hurricane warning comes and they send a signal to the producer of this, this uh, product to send more Pop-Tarts to this area. So they're like these, these kind of systems all are interacting and then they start to trigger transformation. And so imagine that times you know, millions and millions every day of all of these objects slash information flying through space, and they literally are flying through space. This is a, an interior view of one of the distribution centers, and this, this giant uh, enclosure full of boxes moving incredibly fast, all encrypted, um, but organized by the barcode, which helps to organize these things in time and space. And all of these things are um, organized in large 
uh, facilities like this one on the screen. And the, the dream, I would say, of logisticians, the dream of logistics is to eliminate inventory altogether and to suspend items in a constant flow from consumer to producer, uh, and sorry, I'm sorry, from producer to consumer. Um, but the current state of things demands that these points of storage and redirection exist in the form of these large, mostly flat buildings. But, but it's even wrong to call them a building because they're not really architectural in that sense. They're really just a tangle of conveyance systems uh, with the architectural expression of the most minimal kind of enclosure. And these are shuttled, these are connected by a series of trucks that bring them into these, uh, these are the, the super centers, these are where all of this data is generated because every time someone checks out from one of these cash registers, this is where that data gets collected and then sent to one of these data centers, which is where Walmart keeps all of this material. So, so consider the discussions we've been having over the weekend about how all this data exists. All that data exists somewhere. Like the, it has to, it's physically stored in places, and you know all that. But I think it's important to to keep remembering that this is this go this has a this has an environmental and a spatial consequence that I think is worth. Um, considering and, and so all of these numbers f flying through space flying through data streams and then all of these all this physical material flying through space all of this produces habits of mind in which objects and environments become abstracted so that they can be managed and I f this is uh, for me an image that has become a kind of mascot image it's become an image that's a kind of um, really key reference point for me this is from a, an early this is from 1983 but this is a, a magazine a illustration from the journal Army Logistician. But what I like, I like about this image is that it talks about how inventory and environment are rendered in the same way. And you see that the way that's drawn, the building and the, the boxes that this person is moving around are drawn in the same, the same manner. And I think what that suggests is actually this, it reveals, I think, this habit of mind that logistics has, which is to think about the particular and the spatial in both in these sort of abstracted ways to be managed. And so how does that play out in space? An example uh, from the US, this is a map of all of the Walmarts in the country. The blue are the stores, the red are the distribution centers. Um, Walmart uses its precise location capabilities to operate at, at levels beyond the political layer, uh, imbuing its architecture with a kind of political capacity or agency capable of redrawing borders and undermining the political identity of its constituents. And so the, the red circle here is around the state of Vermont, which was the last one in the union to have a Walmart in its borders. Uh, and that's because they fought a really um, long battle with the company to keep them out of their state because they thought it would transform how commerce worked and it would transform the nature of their towns. And they used a lot of political tools to do that. In the meantime, Walmart just built a series of stores around the state, basically surrounding it with its buildings. And so if you take a kind of standard, this is a standard radius of retail catchment, you can see that more or less the Vermont border is sealed by these Walmarts, effectively um, overriding the political uh, boundary. So in a certain sense, we start to see how the logistical mindset might actually be capable of operating beyond the, the kind of uh, political identity of, uh, in this case, a state. And again, this is a very kind of specific example to the US, but I think we can see what I hope here is you can see how these buildings become more than just uh, single entities, but they become part of a network that's coordinated and deployed. So by encircling the state with these precisely targeted locations, Walmart effectively acquired the territory it was pursuing without ever entering Vermont itself. The border that served as a political boundary is trumped by the catchment areas of the store locations and their strategic constellation effectively inscribes a new kind of elastic border within and around Vermont. So faced with this increasing outmigration of its retail tax base, the government of the state eventually agreed to allow Walmart in. And you can see this is one example on the border. Um, this is literally the edge of, it couldn't be any closer unless it was in the water between the two, between the two states. So an environment that's subject to a logistical vision treats inventory and space in the same way, and that spills out into territorial thinking in which, uh, like the objects in the networks, places themselves become abstracted, managed, and optimized. So for the next part, I'd like to talk about the role of friction and fulfillment to understand another layer of how logistics is affecting the built environment. So if the barcode story is about how information leads to uh, a kind of conflation between the abstract and the concrete, how it takes an object and treats it both simultaneously as 
as object and data and how that translates into, into spatial decisions. This question about friction and flows, I think, links to the way we might normalize certain aspects of, of logistics. And so you might remember the fidget spinner from a few uh, summers ago. This was in an article from the New York Times. They declared, you can see on the screen, that fidget spinners are over. Um, but if you look at Amazon's um, top uh, sellers, the same month that the New York Times said there's no more of these things, uh, they were occupying the top 18 of 20 spots in the most popular product. So somehow this thing really caught on, and, and the origins of the toy are contested. Um, some describe it as a kind of nervous tech worker figuring out a way to, to relieve anxiety, and other points to a chemical engineer who was disturbed by the sight of children throwing rocks at police and set out to design something as a way of soothing them. Um, the toys have this kind of dubious uh, um, or claim to have relaxing properties. Um, but underneath them is, this, is the, the very simple ball bearing, um, which I think is um, basically this. It's a central assembly of rings and metallic spheres, and it's, um, it's contributed significantly. This is a kind of at the root of a lot of industrial processes, and it's been a key point of military and geopolitical strategy, uh, exactly because of its ability to reduce friction so that motion may occur more smoothly, more quickly, and for greater duration. The friction spin, the, the fidget spinner, as a, as a fiction reducer, friction reducer, excuse me, as a self-medicating stress reliever and as a device of control and discipline would not be out of place in the worlds of materials handling and logistics, concerned as they are with similar issues of behavior regulation, control, uh, and friction. Other technologies related to friction management are simpler in their mechanism. For example, a single ball transfer unit, effectively a lone ball bearing, is insufficient to offset the weight of an air cargo container. However, thousands of them assembled together lower the coefficient of friction sufficiently to allow a lone human to physically move something that would be otherwise impossible to handle. So once again, the bearing, you see the bearing's success, this time by trans transforming the architecture itself. It literally is changing the surface that we, that we navigate uh, by changing the floor of the fulfillment center into an effectively frictionless surface. Logistics companies create a new kind of environment that hints at the transformations wrought by the industry. Overcoming physical friction mechanically is necessary to ensure the movement of things, and this is a an example of some of the specifications of these products. This language of friction also spills out into all aspects in, uh, in, in pursuit of optimization. So here's a, um, a management consultancy firm promising a frictionless future through a series of, of uh, tools and techniques for management systems. But I think this notion of how friction has become normalized is significant because it, it makes the idea, when we talk about how things need to flow, especially something like logistics, it, it makes the movement of all of these things seem natural. It talks about how it f if, if things are meant to flow, it's as if they are a part of a natural feature, the way the water flows uh, or that air flows, when in fact these things are carried uh, at, great, at great effort. Um, and in fact, um, in order to, to deal with the challenge of moving all these things through space, uh, humans are increasingly incompatible with the demands of the companies that are... That are um, driving these kinds of transformations. So to overcome these incompatibilities, there are, of course, a series of developing, uh, developments related to augmenting technologies that help, us, help us cope with the demands of the logistical environment. So in these cases, automated systems of moving people up and down through the giant shelves of these warehouses. But there's a limit, of course, to the, in, the ter in terms of the corporate demand for speed uh, and for uh, fulfillment companies. I mean, right now, the, the the, the humans in these systems are the kind of uh, cheapest way to do this, but, but companies are ideally moving toward, I mean, from their point of view, moving toward automation. And so um, the bulk of this part will be about Kiva Systems, which is now Amazon Robotics, uh, which creates a condition in which workers are stationary as these small, the orange, um, these small robotic drive units bring shelves to them uh, for order assembly. So instead of moving, walking through miles and miles of distribution centers, you stay in this, this one station and these shelves are, are brought to you. And so you, you basically act as a kind of organic valve mediating between the automated inventory floor and the awaiting delivery vehicles. So as the space of logistics continues 
to transform from mechanized to entirely automated, the ability to interact with these environments becomes increasingly dependent on mediating and decrypting technologies. Even if these environments are products of human ingenuity and even if their contents reflect some idea of fulfillment, access to them becomes more and more remote. If the habits of mind that form uh, in the space of logistics are biased toward control and efficiency, and as the industry spreads and serves as training grounds for those seeking power or influence, similar thinking will likely try to assert its values on spaces not designed to be either efficient or uh, profitable. So broadly speaking, the initial concerns of automation, especially in warehouses, were primarily those of position and location and movement. Early automated guided vehicles from the 1980s would follow fixed and uh, looping paths, you'd see those in the left and the center, uh, often controlled by networks of transducers. But by comparison, the, the system, system, system designed in the early 2010s by Kiva Systems does not require a predetermined path, but relies on a host of, of these robotic drive units operating in unison and with common goals. They go where they need to go and then return to the most convenient location. And you can see that on the far right, this image of, of these robots moving as particles, basically. So Kiva's uh, innovation is significant because in spite of all these attempts, automated fulfillment has become a kind of uh, elusive thing in the, in the logistics industry. And this was why it was purchased in 2012 by Amazon for $775 million and has become the cornerstone of their uh, Amazon robotics venture. So these RDUs, they're, they're, the way they work, they're equipped with a little cam, they lift up the yellow shelf, and then they uh, move that from place to place. Um, and so uh, what's I think fascinating, according to the way that, that the company describes it in its patents, and this is them, this is the language quote, the mobile drive units respond to the order request with bids that represent the amount of time each mobile drive unit calculates it would take to deliver the requested item. The winning bid then delivers its charge to the awaiting station. Once the items have been picked, the RDU brings the shelf not to its original position, but to the closest open slot. And so, end quote. So what I think is significant about that is, is if you think about like a library system where a book is always in the same place, you take the book off the shelf and then you put it back on that shelf in the same position. Here, this is, this is not the case. This is reconfiguring the warehouse every single time an order is fulfilled. So some of these breakthroughs, I think, in, in the system were to make the system into independent units, to make storage and inventory the same thing, and then also to make storage uh, mobile. Historically, storage has been assumed to be a fixed element of distribution systems. Something, uh, some storage racks actually serve as double duty of the structure of the building, uh, and so the actual uh, support for the roof, which in this case the storage would become the architecture itself. Uh, but Kiva, the Kiva system undoes this by not insisting that storage elements remain static and by animating them with a certain kind of intelligence. Instead of machine buildings populated with robot-like humans, as we might imagine from familiar science fiction tropes, Kiva creates a machine landscape, I would say, of building-like robots. And the system uh, forms a kind of internal communication that creates this overall organization in which the racks uh, with frequently requested items drift toward the closer packing stations. Um, and this is described by the um, designer as, quote, a complex adaptive system that demonstrates emergent system behavior, end quotes. And he, he cites references, and maybe if you've been following some of these things, this is from management discussions from 10 years ago about emergence and swarms. And, and this, from an architectural point of view, this became a kind of obsession in, uh, in let's say, a decade ago, uh, trying to make buildings that looked like emergent systems. What I find fascinating about Kiva here is they actually are making a building that is emergent in the sense that this is a swarm of, of shelves that is constantly uh, transforming itself. And so instead of a fixed form that suggests a field, here's a dynamic set of elements, each controlled by a, a simple local feedback, yet collectively creating a shifting whole whose form reflects a content we cannot understand. The map of Akiva Warehouse is a picture of our own collective consumer desires and impulsive quests for fulfillment, but encrypted and presented back to us as a machine language that we can't read. But we'd be mistaken to think that we're not part of this landscape because the noise of this robotic floor is, of course, entirely rationalized and governed by a series of shepherding algorithms that ensure that each of these uh, robots makes it uh, back to a picking station. Uh, but as I was saying, the ones that are the purple ones are the ones that are less frequently ordered. These are the ones that slowly get sort of moved into the center while the more frequent ones, the hot ones, stay at the edge. So 
as logistics becomes automated and spaces and configurations become opaque, even to those who've designed them, this process like Walmart developing property remotely uh, and based solely on forecasting data further abstracts conditions on the ground for those impositions to affect the future of those conditions. So the banality of these transactions wears down the friction within them, further accelerating this process. I think it's conceivable that the landscapes uh, that, that will be, um, the landscape will become so specifically calibrated to respond to our forecasted collective desires that we'll not be able to recognize our own reflection within it, a kind of blind collective narcissus staring at an image of our desire but not capable of decrypting it. So the apparent autonomy of the Amazon Robotics automated fulfillment floor suggests, if not creates, a kind of historical inevitability. The how of the mechanism supersedes the why, and the spectacles of auto autonomous fulfillment landscapes justify the system that they propagate. In other words, the underlying assumptions and values about the consumer society on which Amazon is built become more and more normalized through a set of technologies that create greater and greater distance between action and consequences. In the case of Amazon, participation in a consumer process is rendered remote and instantaneous. We can track the progress of our items, a process that reduces the efforts and the complexities of the supply chain to a series of checkpoints. If we were to try to do more than haphazardly monitor the process of order fulfillment, our frustration would continue because of the unintelligibility of that fulfillment landscape. In a certain sense, a wilderness of machines of our own making that, while not autonomous, seems to grow itself. The informational double that is the barcode has enabled the world's stuff to be fragmented and distributed and multiplied. Capable of being managed at a distance and summoned given sufficient resources on impulse, the world of things facilitated by the barcode and inaugurated with a pack of juicy fruit can hardly be visualized, let alone ordered. As logistical technologies advance, optimization algorithms increasingly determine the location of inventories, thereby creating greater distances between their own logics and the humans involved with accessing them. If the barcode is a language by and for machines, an Amazon automated warehouse floor, for example, is that language turned spatial. Like the barcode, the patterns of movement on the floor are governed by algorithms but are illegible to their human authors. Rather than conforming to an enlightenment model of order, as in, as in for example, analog warehouses, Amazon's system presents a version of storage governed by priorities of speed, flexibility, and frequency of demand. This retrieval process is not registering some kind of entropic erosion, but rather a different level of order, a machine-readable environment underpinned by the machine-readable language of the barcode. But like electrification, fulfillment is on its way to becoming a new utility and a new expectation of contemporary life. And like electrification, it's changing us in the process. The degree to which we collectively depend on these systems then becomes a key question. In the context of an increasingly technomorphic landscape, companies like Amazon thrive if we're isolated as individual consuming subjects, as generators of data. If we accept that automation has a technological momentum that will work to shape the built environment to its own expedient ends, then rather than stepping aside to let technology run its course, there's an opportunity to treat this as an architectural issue or at least as a spatial one. I think architecture has always been implicated in these questions of technology, but I think our challenge now, I mean, I would say our challenge as architects, um, speaking, I guess, personally, uh, is to offer, a suit or to, to search for more seductive responses, to search for new typological inventions, and to generate dispositional modes of practice that see the political problems of logistics as fundamentally architectural, uh, which leads to my last, um, my last and much shorter story to, to conclude. So um, infrastructure, I would say, is both a product and a driver of imagination. As infrastructure actually conditions our reality, it's, it's driven by searches for alternatives, but also shapes the way that that future is envisioned. So desire, both indi individually and collectively, could still open up uh, to all sorts of new possibilities. Infrastructures and the logistical processes they support are generally underspecified systems capable of being read used and appropriated in a, w in a range of unexpected ways. This, they're not a given, but they're something that we constantly negotiate or agree with or submit to. Infrastructure conditions the set of choices we have available 
but it's also something whose design and disposition we can engage in order to more directly contribute to the shaping of a world in which we want to live. It's something, indeed, we might renegotiate entirely. So this is an interesting moment, um, this example, this, this um, record. This is an in interesting moment when infrastructure actually becomes, and its policies became part of popular culture briefly in Sweden, um, at least for a year. So, so I'd like to play a few bars of this song from this record from 1967. I won't play the whole thing. En annan tar de ljuvan, tar en chans att de har byggt. Han fixar och han trixar, glömmer bort att han är gift. Sen står han där med vänster trassel, lyxis för att gå på trassel, ljuger för dem. I won't, I'll spare you the rest of it, but I, I think you, if you're so motivated, you can, you can seek it out on uh, YouTube. But, but for the Swedish speakers among you, um, you might know that Helde Tilger, uh, sorry, Helde Tilger, uh, Svensson means something like move to the right, buddy. So Huger in Swedish is, is right. And this was the winner of a song competition to promote an upcoming policy shift um, in 1967, in which on September 3rd, all the drivers in Sweden would start driving on the right side of the road instead of the left. So before that, before 1967, since Sweden motorists would drive in the left lane as in England. So to many, this condition raised a number of regulatory and safety and commercial concerns. So a governmental resolution initiated the process and after a gradually intensifying media and educational campaign, which included this song contest that produced what we just heard, various kinds of logos, commemorative merchandise, um, novelty merchandise, and virtually kind of nonstop television coverage leading to this shift, the country suddenly and all at once changed to the other side. And just as a side note, I find the logo to be a very nice graphic uh, solution here because the, um, not only is the H standing for to the right, also the, the white lines between the two vertical strokes become the dividing lines of the, the highway. And this is the day of the switch. So within the context of infrastructural imaginary, here's an example of an instantaneous reworking of the practice of infrastructure. So to borrow the philosopher Charles Taylor's notion of the social imaginary, he writes, quote, the social imaginary is that common understanding that makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. And if we were to inflect this to include infrastructure, we could also write, the infrastructural imaginary is that common understanding that makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. So I love this example from, from Sweden in, the, in 1967 because it's a profound reminder that so much of infrastructure is indeed a practice. It's something that's reinforced through daily agreements, but also something that we might rework or reimagine or renegotiate entirely. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse, for such an amazing story. So we have uh, about 10 minutes for, or a bit more, for a Q&A session. Um, у нас есть время на вопросы. Uh, задавайте на русском языке, пожалуйста, волонтеры вам передадут микрофоны. Um, момент. Да, давайте. Вопросы? Well. Uh, JC, thank you for your lecture. It was really um, challenging. So I wanted to ask you regarding this robotics issue. The mo like the question is most relevant for me personally is, um, well, I'm kind of extravagant person. And I'm not like normal, I mean, in terms, if I do something, for example, I use some services or buy something, I will change my mind at least for three times. And 
Uh, for example, if we are talking about delivery services, I will call at least three times and change my position because I'm a freelance worker and I never know like in which time where I will be. So in these terms, this robotics and this machine thing how it gonna handle because sometimes I feel that only you know human connection between me and call center or so I hate doing something only without you know having uh, somebody on the other end so I wonder how how it gonna work for people like me or you know what I mean did you get my question I think, I think so I mean it's possible that the more that you're like from maybe Amazon's point of view the more often that you're shopping and returning things, the more often that they'll be prepared for you. So they might already know that you're going to send it back, so they'll just sort of anticipate that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that they'll get to know you and your habits, and then that will be the way that that, that, that interface would unfold. Um, I mean, I think what I was talking about really are the kind of um, back of house layers of this, but of course there's another um, story about about the actual physical delivery in cities and the, the so-called last mile problem of distribution of how, how the large consolidated infrastructures of these fulfillment centers become connected to the neighborhood or something like that. And so I think this for me was what, um, what I, I think it's interesting to start thinking about how and to what extent and, and if it if at all, but I, I, think, I think it will be something to be thinking about, which is how the expectation of delivery starts to become part of our built environment in the same way that, that maybe, what, 15 years ago, it wasn't common to have Wi-Fi in every space, and now we expect it. You know, it becomes something that we demand. And so to what extent will we demand the ability to simply take that item or that garment that you ordered but decided that you didn't like, and you just put it in the, the chute? And that's all you need to do, and then the whole system will start to integrate that. And you decided that you wanted to live in an apartment with a shoot because you know that you're the kind of person who changes her mind. And so you, so then architects start designing buildings with shoots and those shoots become fueled by technology companies that realize this is a market. And you know, so then suddenly, bit by bit, whole, whole neighborhoods start emerging and then the city starts changing all, all through the kind of identification of consumer behavior. So I think this is something that we, we can start anticipating, but also something, um, you know, it's one of many scenarios, but I think that the, the kind of increasingly ubiquitous dimensions of logistics starts to point to this a little bit. So I don't know, I, I mean, I'm just kind of speculating, but I hope that answers the question a little bit. Jesse, thank you for the presentation. In fact, the silence is quiet with questions, because I want to think a lot and think. Wow! Слушайте, вопрос, вот, инфраструктура, логистика. Инфраструктура для логистики или логистика как способ мышления при создании инфраструктуры? Город — это инфраструктурная машина или это логистическая машина? Спасибо. No, I thank you for the, the question, and I, it's, uh, it's, it's, I, it's nice of you to consider that this is everyone is contemplating. <laughs> but um, I mean, I think your question is a useful one around, um, and an important one, and I, I guess the first thing I might think about is what, what's the value of making the distinction, you know? So, so how, if we, if we think about the, the city as a, as a logistical machine, or the city as an infrastructural machine, how does that help us understand what the city is? And I think that the relationship, let's say, between logistics and infrastructure um, is, I think, it, I think what, of course, the city has always been an infrastructural condition. The, the infrastructure of the city is that which makes society possible. It's the thing that, that um, exists, of course, in a whole range of, of realms, but it, it's often, you know, we might imagine infrastructure as the thing that starts, uh, that comes in, that makes it possible to build a society on. And so I think what, I guess for me, I'm trying to understand is how that infrastructure is changing, 
with the demands of automation and the kind of information rich worlds of logistics. And so I think that if, for me, I would say that the city is increasingly becoming a logistical machine and that maybe that's even putting pressure on what the city is. So maybe we might even not be able to, and again, from a US perspective, maybe we can't, like in the US, it's hard to, for me to talk about the city, more the urban, I think, is the useful category because we start to see how, how um, borders between what might be a historic city uh, and the rest of the territory get blurred because of the, the relationships between all these networks. And so, so I think that whether, um, I think that this, the city in a certain sense is increasingly becoming concerned with resource management and how, how, um, how things move in and out of it. And I think that's, it becomes increasingly dependent on its supporting structures. And I think that's where these logistical questions become so important because uh, we, we're so dependent on these far, far flung networks of systems and, and while it's true that that's often historically been the case, I think more and more as um, these things get accelerated that, that, that logistical thinking and logistical technologies become ever more influential. So uh, and by that I guess to So what, I mean, to come back to what logistics is, I mean, I think it's, it's both a set of technologies but also um, a way of thinking. And so that's what I guess what I was trying to, um, what I've been trying to understand better is how, how the combination of both a set of technologies and a mindset start to change the way decisions are made about the city. And I think the reason I've been looking at these corporations is that they, um, I think they're kind of at the front of these things. So I think that's where um, we can see a kind of frontier of transformation and, um, and, an, and an effort to try to maybe anticipate what might, what might come. Does that get to some of the question a little bit? Okay. Oh, hold on. Да, дальше. Вон молодой человек. Hello, JC. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question for you. So Vermont tried to uh, stop Walmart from coming in because they were afraid that this big corporation will replace like the old mom and pop business because it's just more efficient and this was what ended up happening actually um, and then you showed us the Walmart from the inside and the Amazon that is sorry um, and we really see that indeed the machines are more efficient than humans so um, I wouldn't ask you where do we draw the line of when, while creating something which is in the end will replace us probably because it works better, it thinks better, it knows more than us. I wouldn't say where we draw the line because that's just pessimistic, but how do we negotiate this balance between um, creating machines for us and creating machines that can replace us? Thanks for your thanks for your question. I think that's um, really well put, and um, and I think it's to the heart of some of these these questions that I've been trying to raise. Um, I mean, I think one thing that that we might think about, and I and I think this comes back to how we're how we're imagined as data sources. I mean, I think if we're if we if we um, I think that maybe one way to answer it is to to ask a, a follow-up question, which is what, what are our values? I mean, what's important to us both individually and, and collectively? And so if, if efficiency is the primary metric, then it will be difficult to draw a line. But if there's other things that we think are important, then I think we can start to assert that. And I think one thing that at least Amazon um, tries to do is to, to separate us into these market segments and fragments so that so that we get exactly what we think we need, but at the expense of, of understanding ourselves as part of a larger group. And so I was really, um, it was amazing to see this previous presentation from Ekaterina about the way that we can use, for example, large uh, data sources to find new audiences and find new surprising groups that we don't necessarily uh, see right away or that aren't immediately uh, marketable. So I've been wondering with my own design work, what things, don't benefit from being efficient. You know, what are the kinds of interactions that can't become accelerated? So, 
So, you know, what does it mean to, to, to it would, it, would it make sense to sleep more efficiently or would it make sense to have conversations more efficiently? The, would it make sense to fall in love more efficiently? These are the kinds of things that don't, don't become easily translated into a kind of machine environment. And I think that's maybe a place to start to be thinking about, about the kind of, um, the things that remain irrational, the things that we can't, um, we can't sort of put into an efficiency uh, regimen and that might be, that might be one place to start. I mean, of course, that sounds like maybe a naive answer that there's, there's always ways to make all of the things I'm describing more efficient, but, but I do think that it comes back to this question of values uh, and I think, and, and how we want to assert those values. Вопрос на первом ряду. Спасибо. А если мы пойдем по пути увеличения численности нашей цивилизации, да, то тогда нам а, просто не хватит места на поверхности Земли. И в результате мы либо спустимся под землю, либо а, будем развозить, как а, Amazon на своих дронах, а, да, посылки. Вот каким вам кажется более перспективная дорога а, доставлять а, некие посылки, да, инфраструктуру под землей, а, либо развозить ее по воздуху, как вам кажется? Uh, wow, what a great question. Um, I mean, I will be hesitant to, uh, to st we should go both, just, you know, why not, why not to recover all our bases? Um, no, but I mean, I guess in seriousness, I mean, I think that um, the question of, about resources that you raise is an important one um, around, around the kind of limitations of, of use. And I, and I think that um, comes back again to maybe questions of, of values and around how, um, how we might use some of this, these tools that we have available to us to think about the ways that resources are distributed. And so we know that there's an incredibly uneven distribution of resources now. And, the, and, and um, you know, where I come from is a, is a major perpetrator of that. Um, and I think this is something that won't be able to, to last. And so I think when we start thinking about, about how some of these technologies and some of these, these sort of amazing abilities to translate data can, can be directed toward searching for those kinds of things, I think that will be a place to start. So I think if we can consider the role of larger questions of, of, of spatial equality or resource distribution, I mean, I think this is where things like these logistical technologies might be developed. And I realize I keep sounding very kind of naive about these things, but I think this is, you know, we, we're, we're, we're at a place where we need to be thinking about this stuff. So I think the, the root of your question is a really important one around, um, what's what are the kind of future pressures that we'll be needing to to deal with and then um afterward we can talk more about what what it would mean to live in the clouds or or live underground but thank you Вопрос. um good day thanks for the lecture uh could you please comment on how do these um technologies that have to do with uh, automation shape the development of uh, logistics and retail maybe in uh, developing countries where the labor is cheap uh, so is so uh, it's not uh, clear if there is an economic need to replace uh, cheap labor with uh, probably expensive automation technologies such as countries such as uh, south asia east asia so yeah um, yeah, it's a good it's a good question. I mean, I think it's something that I'm trying to um, understand better. So I think my answer won't be as as sort of informed as I would like it to be. But but I think that it's um, I think it also comes back to the the sources of these kinds of of forces. So what why we why we have these systems in the first place, and you know where is the origin of consumer desire? I mean, I would say that that ideally we could figure out a better way, a better model than, than the consumer society of the West for, I, I think again, um, unlikely, but I think that the, um, the labor um, question is often related to production and I think with distribution, um, it's possible that, you, that, a, that a more direct relationship gets created between, between origin and endpoint. So I think that could be one, um, one direction and I think that I mean to come back to Yarmo's presentation from earlier in the afternoon I thought that the observation about the challenge of a legacy is really 
significant. And I think that in places where there is not a kind of um, deeply embedded infrastructural legacy, there's more opportunity to think more um, innovatively or more cleverly about how to set up distribution channels to make sure that, that people, things get to where people need them. Um, and so, so I think, I mean, in terms of a, re a relationship to a labor question, um, I think it, it, at least for the logistics question, it might be a bit more about how things get moved around. Um, and I would say that there are opportunities to, to try to not um, reinforce outdated models, but to try to think about how we might take advantage of the distributed, uh, decentralized possibilities of, of distributing things. Возможно, последний вопрос, если остались. Спасибо большое.